Welcome back to the Cordell and Cordell and Men's Divorce video and podcast. I'm Scott Trout, CEO and managing partner of Cordell and Cordell. And in this, we continue to bring you issues for guys before, during, and after divorce across the spectrum of family law. Uh, today is no different as we're going to talk a little bit about um, a common name of orders of protection. We'll get into the particular name uh, with our guest, Christina from Florida. Welcome. Hey, good morning, Scott. Great good to morning. Here. Thanks for joining. And before we get started and talk about this really big topic that's important to guys to take action on, I always give us a caution that is, don't want you to take this as attorney client relationship. Don't take this as legal advice. Your case, your facts, your circumstances are entirely different. They are unique and they would require a consult. They would require us to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to gather the details and to provide you uh, the best strategy and the best legal advice. That's just something we can't do in these. You know, we do these seminars around the country at night in person and we don't do this, you know, we don't do legal advice there. We don't want to give that to you and give you that impression. But of course we are available and they're available in our Jacksonville, Florida office as well. You can look us up on the web at cordellcordell.com or call 866 dad's law you'll find out more information and don't forget to tune in each month coming up in august we have our virtual town hall where you'll have an opportunity to join live ask questions live of our cordell and cordell attorneys from around the country and get answers on the spot so check us out at cordellcordell.com you can find us also on facebook get more information to register for our upcoming virtual town hall twice each week we do this podcast we'll continue to bring you the latest information uh, on guys with guys facing divorce paternity contempt child support issues modifications and everything all right so you know we're here for a reason that's to uh, hear about what we call I guess in Florida they use the word is it temporary injunction is that the word they use in Florida yes so what's most commonly brought to our attention is that guys are being served with a temporary injunction which leads to a hearing about two weeks later and type of hearing it is, is an injunction for protection and could result in a final injunction here in Florida. So here in Missouri, um, it is called like an order of protection, or I've heard of adult abuse order or protection from abuse, a PFA. Is that the same thing in Florida? It is. Every state defines it a little bit differently. I know in Tennessee, it's, an, it's a restraining order. Um, they all effectively do the same thing. They keep somebody away from someone else and can strip you of your rights. And every order is gonna be a little bit different, which is why it's so important for us to review the allegations against you, whether it's stalking, whether it's actual domestic violence, so that we can see what a client is facing. So the first, you know, common reaction for guys, they get served with this typically, um, you know, how it works here in Missouri, maybe different in Florida, sheriff shows up, knocks on the door, hands you this piece of paper and says, all right, you've got 15 minutes to gather what you can in your arms, you know, and get out. I don't care where you go, but you're not staying here. You know, one, guys are in shock. They didn't know it was coming, perhaps. Uh, two, they don't know what to grab. They're worried about, you know, how long am I out? They don't really get a chance to review this document. So they're in shock and they're out and they have nowhere to go or they find somewhere to go and they do nothing. So, I mean, I assume, you know, I know I, what I'd say, this is the worst advice is to wait and to do nothing, right? What should they be doing once they get served? So the situation that you described perfectly describes what happens in Florida. You get the knock on the door and then you're out. And a lot of people will put their head in the sand and that is not the right answer. There are a lot of things on the line and you've got this piece of paper that you've been handed and in two weeks you're supposed to show up in front of a judge and face all these allegations that were just written down with no proof and so if you have two weeks time is of the essence you have constitutional rights on the line you have a potential order that's telling you you can't go back home you can't see your children you can't have your firearms a lot of our clients have jobs that require them to carry a firearm so now your livelihood is at stake and so you want to get to an attorney right away and start figuring out what proof you have that you can gather that's not locked in the home that you can't access anymore. And if that's the case, you need to figure out how we're going to access that proof for you. Yeah, it is. And I've said this before, not to diminish, I mean, or minimize, there are some serious issues in uh, the domestic violence era, no doubt, or area, right? Uh, there are real issues in which people need these orders. But it, to me, you know, I've been doing this 27 years. It is the single most abused statute uh, in family law where the level of proof to go get one of these, at least in Missouri, is I can walk into the court 
without the other side, say he threatened to kill me, and that's all that's needed, and I get exclusive possession of the home for two weeks or more. Is that the way it is in Florida? That's exactly the case. When I was practicing in Tennessee, we used to call it the trifecta. Someone would file for divorce, they would walk down to the Department of Revenue and file a child support action, and then next thing you know, you were being served with a domestic violence or a restraining order saying get out of your home. And so now you were fighting litigation on three fronts, which is so overwhelming. And it, and it happens in Florida too, in the exact same fashion, and it, which is why you have to jump into action immediately, particularly because in, we all know that family law cases can be drawn out just because the judicial process is slow. The injunction process is lightning speed comparatively. You are going from being kicked out of your house to two weeks later, you have a trial. And that's what people don't understand is that that hearing two weeks later is potentially make or break. Because if a final injunction is entered, then your next remedy is to go to the appellate court. And that's an expensive process that you don't want to deal with if you can avoid it. And so it's so important to treat it as important as it is. And from day one, take action, reach out, get some counsel, and figure out how you're going to fight it. Yeah, it's, it's so damaging if you do nothing they enter a default judgment against you uh, as you mentioned earlier one of the key things is not only the the, re the ability to carry and own possess a handgun for your work but you know for pleasure if you're a hunter Absolutely. you can lose that right and and that there's just a lot on the line not only that but custody if there are allegations against you it could be used against you if there's a finding of domestic violence um, so it's so critically important but, but more importantly i think many guys assume that once they're served, well, this is just a formality. And I, I get it because I've said this in seminars around the country that judges, they, they don't want to take risks most of the time. And so they'll take the path of least resistance. And that is they don't want to be the next judge, you know, on the nightly news who denied an order of protection or temporary injunction. And there was something that happened, you know, someone died, right? But there are particularly what's wonderful about this system is, you know, a, a person, a petitioner, your spouse goes in, they usually don't have their attorney with them. So the level of pleading, the proof, the facts, the allegations may never rise to the level. So it may present itself an opportunity, right, to challenge the facts. Like, for example, in Missouri, they may say, um, he stalked me last night. So in Missouri, uh, a stalking has to be more than one occasion. So they may only plead one. They may have had a number of, of occasions, but they only pled one. That's enough to throw it out. So I assume that's the same case, whether it be Tennessee or Florida for you, the facts matter? Absolutely. Uh, about two months ago, I would say I had an injunction hearing where I was able to get my client back in the home because she failed to plead for exclusive use and possession. She wasn't living at the home. It just happened to be that that was the last place they lived together. She claimed that as her home. And then during the hearing, when she testified that she lived elsewhere and wanted exclusive use and possession of my client's home, I was able to successfully argue that it wasn't pled. And so regardless of the domestic violence situation, she was not entitled to that form of relief. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest trap, and you know, you think about this, that guys face, they get served, they're out. Maybe it's, I call it buyer's remorse, right? You know, so your, your spouse then all of a sudden feels badly about kicking you out and starts making contact with you. It's a trap. So what do guys do? They're sending a text, they're making a call, they say, come, you know, come meet me, can I come over, I miss you. What do they do? Danger, Will Robinson, stay away. <laughs> stay away, no matter what, no matter how kind the messages are, no matter how apologetic the messages are, do not respond. Because in fact, if this person starts messaging you and you give me screenshots of those messages, then I can use that to show that this person does not have a verifiable and continued fear of contact with you because that goes against their petition. And so it benefits you, no matter, even if your kids are not with you, it benefits you to sit tight for two weeks and go to this hearing because the messages that they are sending to you can be used against you. Yeah, I've had clients go to jail. Um, you know, he goes, yeah, she came over and, you know, we spent the night together in my hotel and it was great. And then all of a sudden she files a criminal complaint saying um, he, you know, violated the order of protection. And he did. Even though it was by consent, it, you're still going to be in trouble. Oh, yeah. And what's worse is that, well, we can use that against her in 
the injunction matter and say, yes, this person does not have a reasonable fear, there is a court order in effect. And if you violate that court order, then there are usually in Florida, it's going to be a misdemeanor criminal matter. And the criminal matter does not care that she initiated the contact. The contact is the contact. You've gone to jail and now your criminal case will proceed without you. And that too can help can hurt your custody case. For some dads out there, the coronavirus pandemic has become a pretext to limit access to their children. Other dads have been pushed out of key decisions affecting their children's lives. If you're one of those dads, Cordell & Cordell is here for you, as always, but with expanded services. We can meet you in person or by video conference on weekdays, evenings, or weekends. Our goal is to step up our service to meet your needs now. You know, we talk about um, one of the 10 stupidest mistakes guys make when facing divorce is I uh, talk about the doctor, patient, uh, attorney, client relationship, that they should be the same. You know, when we all want to be, you know, we're sick or we don't feel well, we call the doctor and we give them every fact that we can think of. You know, my, my left arm may hurt, but I tell them about my right pinky. You know, or, you know, it looks a little swollen, it has nothing to do with my arm that I'm complaining about, but it's a weird relationship where attorneys and clients, you don't tend to get all the facts right away. We feel like we have to peel it out of you. And I get it, you know, embarrassing, sensitive, I think, but what I would suggest, I imagine you would too, the most important thing is to be direct, open, honest, give all the facts, you know, bring documents, phone records, you name it in, in preparation to, you know, try to defeat this injunction, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I always tell people there is no awkward conversation between us. We are about to get really close really quickly because I need to know everything because that is how I can quickly reframe questions if we're in a hearing, if I know the facts surrounding it. <clears throat> and because we only have two weeks, I like to use depositions for injunctions. In order to get someone served, to get a deposition done, to get a transcript done, we need to start right away. And so I need those text messages and I need them properly screenshotted where I can see who you were texting and what date it was. I need your photos. I need everything that you can possibly think of. And if you come into that first meeting with every piece of proof that might help you, then we are already miles ahead at trying to figure out how we're going to get you out of this or at least how we're going to mitigate it and get yeah. to a result. Yeah, it's, you know, I was having a conversation with a client the other day uh, and, uh, you know, they were hesitant, I could tell, to, to kind of give information that was sensitive. You know, it was embarrassing uh, talking about uh, photos and videos that they had, you know, exchanged with each other. And I said, look, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I, I'm pretty confident I've seen it all and I've heard it all and it's not going to bother me. You shouldn't be embarrassed. I get it. It is what it is. And, you know, we try to put the client at ease, but they have to understand that some of those things are important to share because you never know what can and can't be used, especially if they're, you know, let's say you've been kicked out on an injunction and uh, she starts sending you all these photos and they're explicit and, you know, in an attempt to engage you. I'd use those to show that she's not in fear for her safety, that she isn't, you know, threatened by you, that, you know, she wants to engage in a conversation. You know, isn't that important? It's absolutely important. Everything can help. And we're, we're very open. We're in very direct with our clients. We're going to cut through the weeds and get to the meat of everything. But we need to know what's out there. And so it, whatever it is that she may say against you, you could have knocked into her in the hallway. We need to know. Because if that's the case, and she didn't want you knocking into her in the hallway, then we need to be able to explain the situation ahead of time. So let's flip, uh, you know, the scenario. I've had a client who was assaulted uh, by his wife. She used a, a, a cast iron skillet and broke both of his orbital sockets, you know, and, and just destroy, you know, destroyed his face. And so we have guys out there. It, it is, and, and you know, it happens. So guys, guys are listening. They're watching. They're the victim. What do they do? You know, what's the best advice? So a lot of clients who come to us have already filed that petition for injunction. They still have, once that person is served, we're still in that two-week situation where we need to take action. And on that end of it, 
I will usually amend that petition to make sure that the reverse of what we were talking about before doesn't happen, that we have pled the proper statutory basis so that they go into court and the judge can award them the relief that they're actually seeking. So we wanna make sure that if you need exclusive use and possession of the home, that we can get that for you. If support is an issue, we need to know that so that we can put that all into that petition. And then when we go to the hearing, and a lot of our guys have this problem, and I have this conversation with a whole of them. You guys are so strong, and you don't wanna admit that something bad happened. And so you need to go in there and be prepared to convince a judge who doesn't know you that you actually are afraid of the person who harmed you. And so we can do that with a lot of proof if you've got the proof of the damage of what was done either to your property or to yourself, but you have to be prepared to be genuine and to be vulnerable. And that's what I walk my clients through is making sure that they're okay with that level of sensitivity because in order to prevail, the judge needs to understand that the fear is real. It is. It's, it's kind of, you know, I remember in this particular case I described, it was a challenge. You know, he felt like, hey, you know, I'm a man. I should have, you know, defended myself or prevented it. And, you know, I'm not a victim. I don't need to do it. And the judge even got caught up in it and saying, well, you know, he's a guy. You know, why couldn't he just walked away or protected himself? And I said, look, you know, the perfect justice is, judge, you don't know who the petitioner is and you don't know who the respondent is. All you know is the facts. Someone was assaulted someone was injured you don't care if it's a man or a woman and i think that's more important and the judge kind of sat back and thought you know what you're right it, it, lady justice is blind right it has a blindfold and that's the way it should be and guys need to think about that and i think it's really important and first you know safety get to safety first right um but it is it, and, and don't be afraid to to stand up for your rights and assert them and to use this to your advantage obviously i think that's it's huge and you know we've talked you mentioned earlier about avoiding contact, don't respond. Same goes for a guy that's the petitioner and getting the order of protection. If the, um, the defendant respondent contacts you, what do you do? Do not respond. And you never respond in any of these situations because the reverse situation will be used against you. The court will ask you, if, even if there's no attorneys involved and the person says, well, they've been texting me. The court's going to say, well, why are you contacting this person that you're afraid of? And so you want to make sure that you're just not doing that contact. The court will order ways if you have children, like our family wizard, where you can safely communicate about the children. They will limit that contact to be things that matter, like just talking about children. If you're in the process of selling a house, just selling the house. And that way, if the person goes off and is talking about other things, then you have those protections in place that you can go back to the court and request the relief that they no longer communicate with you. Yeah. Well, Christina, it's such a, a great amount of information for guys that are either faced with, uh, you know, on the receiving end of such an injunction, order protection, or they need one. You know, guys are afraid to go get it. And um, thanks for joining us and giving us and guys out there the information they need. It was just a small, you know, segment of what they should get. And but thanks for uh, kind of filling them in. Appreciate your time today. Of course. Thank you for having me. So, you know, kind of hearing what, what Christina had to say, reach out. You know, the information is key. Education is power. Uh, set up a consultation. Find out more information. Find an attorney that practices exclusively in family law. That's the kind of the best ad advice you can get. And it, like we do, you know, we've been doing this for 30 years. So obviously, if you need a consult and you want to talk more about it, you can reach us at 866-DADS-LAW or find us on the web at CordellCordell.com or obviously on social media at Cordell and Cordell. So uh, continue to tune in twice a week as we talk about issues just like this that every guy's going through in divorce and post-divorce issues, as well as our virtual town hall coming up in August. Until next time, have a great week.